information that is discussed about that. As they headed out, they weren't aware that just a few hundred miles in East Nova Scotia that a cold front was developing. With such an upper air support, they created an extra tropical cyclone. Also to the south, off the coast of Florida, Hurricane Grace suddenly veered off of its northwestward course and made a turn toward the east. Meanwhile, a high pressure center that extended from the Gulf of Mexico northeastward along the Appalachians into Greenland was also whipping up high winds. When these three colossal weather systems converged on the chilly waters of Newfoundland, they created what was described by one as the storm of the century, a monstrosity that produced high tides, enormous destruction along the beaches of the northeastern seaboard. Parker, pull up that picture. Meanwhile, out in the North Atlantic, the Andrea Gale was bobbing along the waters, whipped by unbelievably powerful winds that have been estimated to be in excess of 100 miles an hour. She was facing waves that were over 100 feet tall. Can you imagine? A few years after that event, in the year 2000, a movie was produced called The Perfect Storm, basically giving an account of the death of these men and what went on in their society, in their land, in their waters. A perfect storm has been brewing in our nation for numbers of years. A combination, you might say, of the storms that are overcoming our land. What I want to do is discuss a few of the several events that are happening within our country and have been happening over the, the several decades here of time and allow us to think about what we are seeing that could be facing much like what these men faced in their seaboard trip. Number one, the removal of God in public places. On June 25, 1962, the United States Supreme Court decided that prayer that was approved by the New York Board of Regents for our schools violated the First Amendments because it represented established religion. Someone later writing said, what could argue that some, and some have, that the decision by the Supreme Court in this series of three decisions back in 1962 and later in 63 to remove Bible and prayer from our public schools may be the most spiritually significant death in our nation's history over the course of the last 55 years. But later on, this individual writes that since 1963, five negative developments have come about uh, in our nation's public schools. Number one, the academic achievement had plummeted, including the SAT scores. Poor education will produce poor decisions. The increased rate of out of wedlock births. Think about it. You know, mom and dad, stability in a home now, poor emotional stability. The increased use of drugs in the home or in, in, the, in the life of the teens. Number four, the increase of juvenile crime and the deterioration of school behavior. Continued battle over the last two decades also has been to remove the Ten Commandments from our government property, at least. June 28, 2005, Chief Justices ruled 5-4 to four that the Ten Commandments could not be displayed in court buildings or on government property. Think about it. No moral, no God, no right or wrong. We are all okay. Removal of God in public places, number one. One storm. Storm number two, the loss of identity as a human being, number one, within that category. In Genesis chapter two, Scripture tells us that man is created in God's image. That man is not a product of evolution. That he is not just some higher form of an animal, but he's made in God's image. Tying in with that loss of identity, we've forgotten the sanctity of life itself. In January 22, 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a 7-2 decision, affirms the legality 
of the woman's right to have an abortion under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. And to this day, infants are murdered every day. We are in the midst of a storm. In spite of what Psalm 139 tells us in verses 13 to 15, where the psalmist writes, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. There's a sanctity in life. Not only is it a man or woman getting together, but God is involved in this process still. Made by the hands of God. We don't know our existence or where we come from. And we don't understand our values. And we don't know, number three, who we are, actually. Application forms to some of our higher U.S. universities under the area called gender offers several different boxes to check other than just male or female. One website that I looked at last night tells it like this. How do we ask in such a kind way for people to describe their gender and being thoughtful and respectful to them? Walter Thompson Innovation Group discovers that 80% of the 30 to 20 year olds described as Generation Z or Gen Z believe that gender does not or did not define a person as much as it used to. They see gender, sexuality, or their own general identity as fluid or different one from what it was assigned at birth. A loss of identity in how God has made us. Again, Genesis 1.27. At the very beginning of the Bible, scriptures tell us that God made us in His image, created us, male and female, He created them, describing the events in Genesis the Garden of Eden. Don't let society deceive you. <coughs> we have a loss of identity of the family itself, which also is created by God. Husband, wife, and children no longer spoken of as normal. Genesis chapter 2, after God creating man, description is how God created the family. It started with parents together, male and female. The family was made by God, a man and a woman in the beginning. There's no record specifically stated about a marriage ceremony, but nonetheless implied that they were a married family unit. They were not live-ins, as we see so much in our society today. We're losing the identity of the family unit from so many different angles. Not just in the gender direction, not just in the living direction, but in so many ways. The family was put together and established by God. Divorce seems to reign in the areas even where there are commitment that starts with the family. So we have one storm, God removed from public places. Yes, his identity reigns in church buildings occasionally here and there. But just for the fact that he's been taken down from institutions that are regarded as sacred and of recommending laws to us is a significant point in itself. The removal from him in schools further accentuates that. The loss of identity, male and female, and family, and individuals. 
Storms brewing in every direction. It creates, in a sense, a third storm. Sometimes hurricanes, you know, come in and create tornadoes. The loss of respect for one another and for each other. We are told by many that we are no different than our animals, that we come or evolve from animals. There is no God. There is no moral absolutes. And then we act surprised when we see people killing one another in our streets, in our arenas, at the workplace, taking lives of police, teachers, ministers, co-workers, fellow students. And we act shocked as if, why did that happen? When God is gone, identity is gone, family is gone, and all that God has created and given to us to establish stability has been removed. What do we do? What do we do as Christians? Number one, I would say, beware of the influence. Hold fast to scriptural teachings. Matthew chapter 7. I want you to take a new look at an old verse. Verses 24 to 27. If you have a pew Bible in front of you and you might have difficulty finding that, it's on page 855. Interesting how appropriate what Jesus' words are to what we do today. As Jesus is closing out the Sermon on the Mount, he wraps up for the culminating point, to then and to now, so applicable in a perfect storm. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, two significant points, hearing and doing, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Listen carefully. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine, number one's covered, and does not do them, number two is missing, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. The wise man, we sing to our children, built his house upon the rock. When the storms come, the wise man's life stands firm. Because his rock, is, his rock is Christ and the scriptures, and that does not go down. The foolish man misses out in his connection with Christ, in his connection with scripture. And he allows the ways of the world to influence him. And his life goes down. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Page 1008 in the New King Bible. The New King James Version says, Be not conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's amazing what we were hearing during the Lord's Supper as John was telling us we are forgetful creatures. And Paul's telling you, be renewing your mind in order to Keep the transformation. The mind has to be renewed on a regular basis or the result will be the world will take you into its mold. I'm sure many of you at one time or other have used some kind of a mold, whether it's with Play-Doh or whatever, and you take that little plastic mold and you press the Play-Doh and you pull it out, it's exactly like the mold. And that is what the world wants to do to us. It wants to make us like them. Paul says, be transformed 
not conform. We don't allow, as one translation, the world to put us into its mold. Beware of its influence. Hold fast to the scriptures. Number two, along with this, be mindful, Christians. Don't be like the Pharisees. They knew their scriptures in the time of Jesus. They understood the accuracy and the intricacy of all the details. When Jesus spoke about them, he said, do what they tell you, but don't do like them. For they bind heavy burdens on the people, but they're not willing to with one finger help them lift their load. We have to be different as the people of God. Not looking down our noses at people and saying, we're better than you and we don't want to have anything to do. We don't touch, we don't associate, we don't eat with you. That's exactly what the Pharisees did in the time of Jesus. But the reverse of that, number three, is to be like Jesus or to love like Him. <coughs> the impact that Jesus made on the society that He lived in was not because they were just perfect people. They were sinners wrapped up in so many things like the world that we live in today. And yet He came out differently to them. We live in a world confused. Kids growing up in homes where mom and dad don't exist anymore. Some of them have mom and a mom or a dad and a dad. And they go to school and the school reinforces that same kind of thing. No wonder the teenagers are confused about what's going on. No wonder they have to decide what kind of gender they will be one day. And if they don't like it, they can change back. And we need to understand what Paul says in Ephesians when he talks about teaching the truth in love. Understanding where they come from, much like Jesus understood where the sinners came from that lived in his time. And every one of them, mind you, when you look at the Gospels, felt comfortable at the feet of Jesus. He taught them the truth. But they knew they had a place at the feet of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2. Paul writing inside of the jail. And he's concerned about the people rejoicing over who they are. And he's concerned about their treatment of one another. Verse 2, he says, <clears throat> Fulfill my joy. Make me happy, in other words. By being like-minded. Having the same love. Being of one accord and one mind. Now he's talking to the church. And how they treat one another within the body. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. And he's talking about all of them together. Not just how we treat the favorite ones and the others we disregard, mind you. And then he says this in verse 3. Let nothing. Did you see that word? Nothing. Be done through selfish ambition. Don't do anything that's going to put you ahead of anybody else. Don't do it for that reason. Let nothing be done out of selfish ambition. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. In case you miss it, you come back around it again in the next verse. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, we're good at that, but also for the interest of others. Mind you, he doesn't say some others. He doesn't say the friendly others or the people that treat you nice others. But the implication is all others, thus others. That everybody in the church should feel like 
I appreciate that more than I do myself. That all of us are to have that approach. And what a difference that makes within the church. And when we watch that kind of attitude and have that just <coughs> overflowing within the church, not only does the church gain its strength and it is knitted together as the Colossians letter talks about in chapter 2, but the impact that it makes as we go out into the world and a recognition of how we live that's different than everybody else. And, and people see that. And they don't see us like the hypocrites looking down our noses like we're better than, but hoping to help people break out of the confusion and understand what the truth is. Done in love. Number four, we need to be teaching our children. Deuteronomy 6. When it talks about, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And these things, and he goes on and talks about what the parents are to do with the kids and reinforcing that. They got bombarded by everything out there in society because these storms are hitting in every direction. And when they come home, they need to find a rock-solid place where they can stand and live and see within the parents' lives the same image that's written in the Scriptures. This is how mom and dad are. This is how mom and dad stand with Jesus. This is how they treat one another. This is how they treat their friends and the rest of the people in society in spite of how they are in the world. The parents still love them. And so when unusual people of the world walk into our assemblies or come into our lives in every way. They find a place at our feet alongside of us. I don't mean under us, but like people when they approach Jesus, found a place that they see that. We have to be first century Christian examples to these people. Or they'll never break out of the confusion. The perfect storm is hidden in so many different directions. And there are many things we could talk about that are in addition to that, that are impacting our society. But this, as we've said before, is our Nineveh. As Jonah reached out and looked at this pagan world and wanted to run, God said, this is where I'm putting you. And this is what you do for your protection, for your strength, and for your outreach. So we become proactive in our teaching and with our understanding and love. A little devotional book that my wife was reading to me on the way to church this morning and I said, huh? there's a paragraph worth repeating. When things around you or in the world seem to be spinning out of control, come to me and pour out your heart. Instead of fretting and fuming, put your energy into praying. Come to me not only for comfort, but also for direction. And I will take your prayers into account. And I govern your life. The perfect storm has been brewing for years. This nation is not perfect. Our vote is not going to turn the world around, but if you vote, great. I do. But if you want to turn the world around one soul at a time, then understand that the world we live in is the world that God gave to us to make a difference, to be a lighthouse, to shine the life of Jesus, to make sure that people understand that we are people that stand with God and we love like His Son and like God. I heard a fellow talking just a couple years ago, minister, preacher from somewhere, I think down in Birmingham. They were well known in their congregation for being anti-abortion. To the point that some abortion activists on a certain holiday came out there in front of their building and paraded with signs up and down in front of their building. 
and had all kinds of things written on their signs and praying. And they were out there night and day, vigilant and standing for the rights of women as they talked about. Storms were brewing. There was promise from the people out in the street. The people inside the building were calm and relaxed and, and, and having their services and everything going on. What did they do? They called some community services and had porta potties delivered out there to the aides of the people that were praying against them. When they had fellowship meals, they carried food out the door and fed the people that were out there in the streets holding up the banners against the church. The people shook their head. They couldn't understand why on earth they behaved that way. I don't know what it did in their hearts, who it might have converted. But they treated them like Jesus. They stood fast with their signs in front of the church about being anti-abortion. But they loved them just the same. Those that stood against them. We need that kind of reputation in the world if we're going to change anybody. The storm of the century continues to brew. Those that build their life on Jesus will not have a storm taken to death. How about you? Where's your life anchor? Are you living for Jesus? We ought to have room in our lives for more people to come in to be able to teach them what we need to do and represent Christ in other way. If you're not living that kind of life, I challenge you to consider. I challenge you to get on your knees. I challenge you to get into your scripture. I challenge you to know Jesus. If you're outside of Christ this morning and you're ready to be baptized, we're ready to help you. If you're struggling and confused about anything that's happening in your life, we'll point you to the scripture the best we can and give you the direction that God gives. If you need help this morning, we're ready to help. Would you come while we stand aside?